Welcome back to part four of a guide to starting your own metery. I am joined again by the awesome Billy Belts of Lost Cause Metery. He's here to en again enlighten us even further on what it is or what it means to start your own metery. In the previous three episodes, if you've not watched them, please, please, please go watch them because we're building. We're building this, this really great, I don't know, cake, and we're on layer four right now. Uh, layer one was building, or excuse me, starting and choosing your business model. Part two is the business plan, and then funder, funding the metery, how you're going to get funding for it. Part three was licensures, the building itself, equipment, and we're now in part four, here to talk about recipe development and what that means uh, for a larger scale. As Billy alluded to, whenever you have your stuff at home, it's awesome, but it's a little bit different when you go pro. Sourcing ingredients for your recipes, and then a little bit about some packaging and those things. So, uh, Billy, you said yourself, you guys have a lot of varietals of, uh, variety, excuse me, in your mead as it stands. So you must be sourcing from a lot of different places to get all of this stuff. Yeah, we, um, yeah, and that's when you uh, launch and you are making um, uh, different recipes, different styles of mead, you're going to find that um, having a lot of options to, to source from is critical because things will change. Um you know, there's seasonality, there's price increases, decreases. Um, but as much as uh, our preference is to work with, um, you know, uh, the, the as much as we can, the same people that we, we know and trust, especially when it comes to honey, right? We've sourced from a lot of different uh, suppliers and uh, beekeepers from, from all over the country. And I've really just come back to wanting, um, one, to showcase our local honey and, and also support support our uh, local beekeepers mm -hmm. and building that trust because it's mead, everything comes back to the honey um, and you want to know how that honey was, um, um, you know, how the bees are kept, how the honey is handled, um, how often it's, is it needed to be reheated? Um, you know, what temper are they reheating? And so you want someone you can trust. So when it comes to honey, there are a lot of great options. Um, we, I've learned over six years, I'm, I'm really kind of wanting to come back to, you know, one or two places we really trust and love. But with um, everything else, especially like um, packaging and um, equipment and things, you need to be, uh, you need to have a lot of options. Um, and you need to be able to, to pivot and go to plan B when something else is out of stock. So, so yeah, it's, it's fun. Well, <laughs> the honey side's interesting. I think I'm approaching the path you are in life and that I've tried a bunch of honeys and I want to get a couple of good ones and I want to stick with those and kind of play in that playground. I really like the tons of varieties I've tried, but I do want to try and one, I wish I could support more local locally. Unfortunately, my local honey is extremely expensive. I don't know what your situation is there, but mine is about three times more expensive than I can afford for for what I'm doing. So, struggle there. Now, let's talk about fruits options in that regard. You had mentioned it. I think it was a theoretical recipe or something you talked about. It was a Montmorency cherry, something like that, which. Whenever you mention a fruit like that, I go, well, you've probably worked with it. How do you find, not specifically that, but all of these maybe less common fruits for you? Um, so, yeah, yeah the um, you, you kind of have your local fruits and uh, plants and, and, and herbs and stuff, right, that mm. are... Um, are a representation of, of your area and where you live. And those, you know, you can go straight to the farmer, right? You can go straight to the orchard. Um, and, and that's fantastic. In mead, uh, you will find that there are certain fruits um, that just make meads that sell better, right? And so being in San Diego, 
We have a lot of citrus. Fantastic. We love, we really love citrus in mead. Um, and we do some, some meads we're, we're pretty well known for, like our lemons cello mead that, that showcases local citrus. But um, we have to have a blueberry mead and a uh, black currant mead and a tart cherry mead um, in the lineup mm -hmm. because that's what sells. People love those big um, dark fruits, the berries, where you can make a mead that is high residual sugar, high acid. Um, that's what people love. It, it, it's what sells biologically. We are, we are born to like sugar and acid, right? Yeah. So, um, and, uh, and they make really interesting complex meads. So yeah, those are not, uh, I mean, there's no Montmorency cherry trees, you know, growing in San Diego, right? There's no black currants in San Diego. Right. Um, there's some blueberries, but we're, we're going to have to, um, look further for those. And so you have a lot of options. Um, I am a believer in, you know, whole fruit being the, the highest quality um, and starting there, whether that is uh, fresh whole fruit. Um, so like when we're making a payment, right, yeah. we're bringing in the grapes during harvest season and we are crushing them and we are, um, uh, uh, you know, making the payment right then. Or IQF fruit. Um, mm -hmm. IQF fruit can be fantastic. And you can get that um, year round and you can also get it right from places. So we bring in Montmorency cherries um, from up in Washington and, and Oregon, or if you're on the East coast, you know, from Michigan and or, or wherever. Um, same with black currants, uh, same with a lot of these berries and IQF fruit can be fantastic. Um, you are, there's, there's different ways to use it, but if you're going to be making um, you know, it like a wine style where you, you need a press, right? You're, you're fermenting with the whole fruit, then you're going to press it off. Like you would be making a, a grape wine. Um, you need to consider equipment and that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and how you're also like our fermentation tanks are closed top tanks. So when we're making whole fruit beads, we're using, um, open tanks that, uh, that we can actually, put the fruit in and, and pull out yeah. rather than our big closed top fermenters. So you have to have the right equipment. Um, and then from there, you can also, um, I'm not going to say it's a, you know, what really matters is, is how the fruit is, was, was, was picked and sourced mm -hmm. and where you're getting it from. So whole fruit just doesn't mean it's always better, but um, you get a lot of benefits, especially with berries using whole fruits in the skins. Um, Next, you can look at like juice. Mm. Uh, so like not from concentrate juice, getting frozen juice or fresh pressed. You have a lot of options there. Um, and you can go to, uh, depending on if you're east or west or coast or uh, in the middle of the country, um, that'll dictate where you go to source. But for like us, we're sourcing pretty much any juices from Oregon, Washington, where most of this is all grown for us. Um, bringing it down, we've learned that uh, we can buy drums and totes of fresh ju of juice, of frozen juice, and um, bring it down on a dry freight container. So yeah. you're not paying to, to ship it down cold, like frozen. And it takes, you know, um, like right now, it'll it'll take a week for a drum to thaw. So I can pay, you know, dry freight, which is a third of the price is frozen freight. And have it thaw thawing all the way down and be just fine. Huh. Um, so those are other things you got to consider. Freight is a bitch. It is uh that's another reason you want to stay local as much as you can. Yeah. I just I hate throwing money at you know, just just freight costs. It's it's painful. But yeah, you know, if we want to make a something with black currents, we got to do it. Um and then you have a few other options you can get into juice concentrate. Um, and those can range in, in quality. What, if you're getting juice concentrate, just make sure you're getting it from someone where the it's it's the actual fruit. Mm. There's some companies out there. There's a lot of companies out there. They'll sell you strawberry juice concentrate or blueberry juice concentrate, mm -hmm. and really it's it's grape juice concentrate flavored with with blueberry, and they won't tell you um, unless you really dig in. And I, I hate that. So um, don't you know? Watch out for that. Uh, and then, um, 
last thing you can do, you know, a lot of breweries use um, uh, like purees. Mm. Uh, that's a little tougher to work with. You're going to have a lot of loss, but you can also do that. Organ fruit sells, you know, purees to breweries all around the country and um, they package it aseptic. So you don't have to keep it frozen. You can get it year round. Yeah. Did that answer your question? There's a lot of different ways to, to source fruit. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> you're, you're like, you know, if you're on the East coast or the West coast and I'm like, I'm in the middle of the country, you know, there's definitely, yeah. I'm envious of what's available to you up there uh, where you're at. You know, I think that Seattle, I have a buddy who's in Seattle and he's like, he's just throwing boysenberries in and black currants and he's doing like all of these amazing fruited meads. And I'm like, I mean, I can go and get like frozen blackberries from my Walmart, but like, I'm not going to get anything other than like going through some of these other avenues, which is, these are all great. So let's say we've, we've sourced our ingredients we have figured out for our whatever. I'm not going to pretend to make a recipe here, but we've figured out what we want to make. How do we? How does it change recipe development wise as you go from homebrew level, where I'm at, and the thousands of people are at, to now I have to make this at a 500 gallon size. Obviously, I think that that it'd be great if it was a multiply your gallon by 500, you know, other than yeast, but I don't, I don't feel like it's that way. So what do you, what are some things you would note on that? Yeah, I I think most of the difficulty actually comes in the sourcing, right? It's um, because you just can't, you can't use always the same thing you were using at a homebrew level and you also can't work with it the same way. Mm. Um, all the things I was just talking about, but what in terms of recipe development, uh, a lot of it does scale up pretty um, linear. And like, if you, um, I mean, as a traditional, we've we've found whatever we use for five gallons at home, we could we could directly scale up mm. um, for uh, same thing for a lot of mellow mills, um, and uh, and it actually it. You, you need to have it where it becomes tough is you're often not using the same, you know, type of like the, the same uh, uh, um, where maybe you were you were just picking fresh fruit for your home made, uh, made mead and now you're getting IQF fruit or you're getting, you know, pressed juice. It's a whole different ball game there. Mm. Um, but if you're using the exact same type of ingredient, a lot of times it'll scale up pretty well where you where you can get in troubles with like spices. Mm. Um, and so uh, I always, even with spices, I've learned, um, I mean, there's so much variability from source to source, yeah. right? Uh, always, no matter what your recipe was, start a little lower, go by taste. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a... Uh, less than maybe for no matter what scale you're doing. Um, but yeah, like when you're making a, a um, 500 gallon batch of uh, a capsamel and using, you know, ghost peppers, um, it's not a direct scale from like a, a five gallon batch. So when you you're, don't shoot it. when you're doing that, when you're making something that is so large and you have peppers, um, let's say if you're, you're 500 gallon tank, I know you guys, go by barrels at that point. So I don't know what the barrel capacity is there, but so I'm just going to keep using this 500 analogy, but are you like putting the peppers in a bag and then you, you know, fish line the bag into the big old fermenter and and fish it out whenever you're done. How does that work for a larger scale? Yeah. um, For, for peppers. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, So we're adding anything um, you know, a lot of the fruit will, will ferment, um, uh, you know, and so that's all done in fermentation and primary, um, unless it's like citrus or, or something like yeah. that. Uh, and then in secondary or when you when you rack it into a secondary vessel, whether that's another stainless tank or that is a um, plastic flex tank or it's a barrel. Uh, yeah, there we're just kind of. Um, going in with a bag and then pulling it back out when it's time. And honestly, one of the nice things about mead making that, um, you know, breweries and and wineries don't have uh, get the same benefit from is 
we get to do things like that and and uh, and and revisit our needs time and time again um, without the same worry about oxidation or spoilage that that a brewery or, or winery were, um, would. Now, big caveat there: you have to know what you're doing, right? So you can't just go in um, and open up a tank, pull out the chilies, close the tank, and and, and you're good. Mead still oxidizes, it still spoils. Yeah. So you you know if um, you need to be able to repurge that tank, you need mm. to be able to read, have an oxygen sensor, mm. um, and uh, make sure you're you know you're doing things to protect the mead. But we still get a little more leeway mm. in terms of oxidation than, um, than than the other guys. So yeah, we can kind of that's why I say we can play with spices. We can go and we can add two days later. We can add a little more. We can add a little more. We don't have to nail it on the first go around. Yeah. So on the note of recipe development, let's say we have that recipe, the, a new recipe. Are you, do you suggest that we do these things at a five gallon batch? Like when you are recipe testing, are you doing things at a one, a five? And then, you know, then you jump up to your larger scale. Do you do, is there an in between where you're like, well, I got it at five. Do I need to try 25 first or like, how does that work? Uh, I'm not the best person to ask because we, we, a lot of times just shoot from the hip on, we, we've, I'll say this: I've, I've made enough meads in my life where um, I can uh, I can do something completely new and have a, a good idea of of how it will turn out. And we a lot of times we'll get there, and if we don't, we're pretty good at, at pivoting. Yeah. Um, so we do a lot of bench trials on like secondary additions, mm. um, but. No, I, if we are going to start out with a new mead, let's say we have a um, a great source for pomegranate juice, fresh pomegranate juice, and I've never made a pomegranate mead before, and I I want to see what it's like first. Yeah, we'll do like a five gallon batch, um, but you can s- scale that from five gallons up to you know our thirty barrel tank, so like six hundred gallons, no problem. Yeah. Um, so you don't need you don't have to like um, keep scaling up. I think if you have a proof of concept and you you've made it work um, at any level, you you know go big. Mm. It's just it's just a huge investment, right? So it's are you willing to um, risk it? <laughs> yeah. You know, if it's your first time doing it, not everyone has the the um, the the uh, appetite for risk that that we do. So we we'll go all in because we know we can make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you're a lot of times better off starting small, um, but it really depends on, on, on what you're doing. And I am a huge believer in bench trials. So, um, that's, you know, along the way, Hey, what would, what would some Oak do to this? How about a little at, uh, tartaric or citric acid? What about some, uh, Oak? Do we want to do, you know, Oak tannin or grape tannin? Um, do we want to add anything? What would, what would bubbles do? And that's where we do bench trials. So, you know, we're taking something and we're doing mm. a lot of small um, bench trials and then tasting from there. Interesting. So what are some or what's some advice you'd give to people who are on the cusp of like, well, you know what? I have these recipes that I'd like to, you know, put out there. Obviously, what you're talking about is being flexible to adjust recipes. Do you have any t- uh, tips and tricks on like here's what I suggest to do to get better at tweaking recipes. Like, is there any little thing that helped you and your, your understanding of that overall? Yeah. Um, my best piece of advice is, um, embrace making every style of mead and putting it out there and let your customers tell you what they want to buy and what they want to drink. Um, and I don't, there's a lot of mead makers out there that have a hard time doing that. And, and um, they want to tell the customer what they should drink. And, you know, you can still, if you are committed to the highest quality or you are just committed to, you know, um, low key refreshing, whatever it is, you can, you can accomplish all that within all the different styles of mead. But I will say until you've made a style, 
and you've made it well, or you've made a bunch of versions of that style, and you put it out there in front of the customers, mm-hmm. you really don't know what's going to sell. And we thought we did when we started. I, I thought I knew what kind of style of meat would sell well in San Diego and what people would like. Um, and it turned out to be something totally different um, than what I thought. And so no matter how much homework you've done, um, as a meadery, you're going to want to open and you're wanna going to put as much out there as you can, see what sticks. Because um, you'll learn a lot. And, and you know, most meadery owners have the same story. They Whatever they thought was going to work well, uh, maybe was um, – there was something totally different that now is their bestseller. So Hmm. the other piece of advice to that is um, make sure you're making mellow mills, no matter what you do. Uh, Mellow mills sell. People love fruit. They like things that taste like fruit juice um, or wine. And then uh, people also like, no matter if, if, no matter what kind of style of mead you um, want to make or, or like to drink, People really enjoy uh, high um, sweet acid, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're built to enjoy that. Yeah. And even in San Diego, where you might think it's people are um, going to be big on drier, lighter, lighter styles for, you know, the sunshine and all that. Um, people love these big berry mellow mills mm-hmm. that have... Uh, residual sugar and a lot of acid to balance. Um, and it doesn't mean they, they shouldn't be cloying. They don't need to come off as super sweet, mm-hmm. uh, but they're intense, right? And that intensity is something you can't find a, a, a um, comparison for in the beer world and the wine world necessarily. Uh, and, and so often we have that little corner of the beverage market that we can take advantage of and make these intense meads and really delicious um, uh, meads that showcase, you know, high acid berries like black currants and raspberries and tart cherries. Uh, and so that is something I encourage every mead maker to just try, make, make a style, see how it does. Okay. Make yeah. a big mellow mel. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't need to be your flagship and it doesn't need to be, what you hang your hat on, but but put it out there. You might be surprised how it does. Well, that was kind of my last thing on this topic is I feel like so many meteries I've talked to because uh, I get the uh, the joy of getting to talk to a bunch of people. A lot of meteries say our flagship is this. And I, I'm sure what you're saying is exactly true. I'm sure their flagship might have been theoretically this product at one point, and then it became this one do you feel like it's important to for anybody who wants to start a meadery to to have a declared flagship is there any pro for when people walk in to say like this is the one that sells best this is our flagship or is it just a again another thing to hang your hat on just as a encouragement um so i will say uh it can be great um if you are fo- if you are really depending on distribution, you should have a flagship. Uh, in most cases, uh, you want a flagship product that um, you get out to distribution. Uh, if you're not focusing on distribution, it's less important, mm. I believe. Now you can use a flagship for branding, um, and you can use a flagship mead to say this is what we're about, or this ex- this showcases what we think mead is when it's at its best yeah and, and that's that's fantastic um but you also might find a flagship meet is less important than you think uh, i mean we've gone six years and and we we don't have a flagship meet we, we every year our our best selling meet is something completely different than it was last year um we we may be an outlier there but i think we've proven you don't have to have a a flagship and sometimes relying on a flagship can um, restrain you and keep you from putting out something that may be even better, uh, mm. that, that customers may like even more. So, um, and, and people now, consumers do love uh, the whatever's new, right? This was um, the, the, the current beverage landscape is all about uh, new and people, you know, if you look at millennial and Gen Z drinkers, they're not sticking with one thing. They're not sticking with one brand. They're not 
was thinking one time they want to be adventurous drinkers. Mm, and yeah. so um, if that's your, your market, then, you know, a flagship may not serve you as well as just trying other stuff. So I think it can be great, um, but it's not required. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I, I mainly ask that because I feel like some people feel like they have to walk in with a flagship in order to be successful. But obviously, you guys are a living testimony of a flagship uh, can be a revolving thing. You know, what sells best can be different over time. All right, I have one last question on this topic, and that is about packaging. Not specifically what you put your bottles in or what you put your, your liquid in, but when you are making something and creating a label, I don't want to get too in the weeds because this could turn into a, a whole other episode of a, a podcast, but... Do you have any encouragement on people as they go through the process of, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to get a label through the TTB or wherever. Like, is there any pro tip? Because I've heard it's kind of a mess. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a rabbit hole right there. Um, I I do have uh, I have a lot, a lot of advice there. Um, but my biggest piece of advice is. Understand who you're talking to. So yes, it is a mess. The DTB label approval process is incredibly frustrating because they often don't know the rules when it comes to me. So you can get everything wrong and might get approved. Uh, you can get everything right and it might get kicked back. Yeah. And then you have to explain the rules to them. Um, and their job is to enforce the rules. It's a, it, it can be really messy. But um, remember, these are um, human beings on the other side, and they're they're just trying to uh, to hold everything to a certain standard and set of rules. And they don't they may not know or, or remember the rules for everything. So if you um, you'll get a long way if you just approach it with some grace mm. and don't be afraid to talk to them. I know a lot of meter. Uh, Meadery owners get super frustrated and they've like, they're going back and forth for weeks online. And I'm always just like, pick up the phone. You can literally call the TTB, yeah. uh, get, get someone on the line, have a conversation with them and oftentimes solve it right there. Yeah. And, and um, so that's a big piece of advice. Then I have a lot of uh, like, depending on, on what you want to do, just you have to know what you can and can't do. Don't rely on the TTP for that. If you know what you can and can't do, you'll be fine. Because yeah. not only can you correct them when they're wrong, which you shouldn't have to do, but you will. Um, but you can also understand how to frame your, your formula, how to frame your, your label to give them what they need while still achieving what you want. Mm, okay. um, that sounds kind of vague, but it's, it's really not like you just... If you go on the, the AMMA website, um, used to have some advice in that area. Uh, other than that, you just talk to other meadery owners. You're just going to have to go through it yourself. But you, you just need to figure out, and you can do this by talking to them too, what are the requirements exactly? What are they? And then frame everything within that, and you'll, you'll be just fine. A lot of times, you know... Uh, they don't know, so you have to know in order to, to get it through right. Um, and then the the last thing I'll say about getting uh, 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 TTB approval. Well, I now I forgot what I was talking about or what I, what I had meant to say. There's yeah. one more piece of advice. But, yeah, just um, a, approach it with grace. Make sure, you know, you can always tell them you want to – go up to QC, which is quality control. Hmm. So if you think they're wrong, just say, hey, can I get this approved by QC? Hmm. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Okay. That's that's it. Well, I, that is one topic I've heard from people talking about it, saying it's very frustrating, like you just said. Um, so I think that's great advice, being gracious with them, because they are people too. Sometimes uh, we forget on the internet that there's someone behind the screen on a comment or an email. So, all right. Well, Billy, we've wrapped up episode four. We have gotten pretty deep into this metery so far, this theoretical metery we're starting together. So in this next episode, uh, we are going to talk about 
actually launching it. Marketing. A little bit about Tasting Room, even though we've already kind of been there some, and then a little bit more about maybe distribution if we haven't hit anything there. So again, I encourage you, if you've not heard the first three, please go back, check them out. They will help you understand what we've walked through through all this. And then, of course, if you've not heard of Lost Cause, uh, there will be links below to go and support them. If you're local to them, absolutely go check them out. Find them in person. I wish I could just fly out right now, but um, I, I don't have that kind of money right now. So one day I'll make my way out there. But Billy, thank you for imparting oh. more. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. My, my bad. Sorry to cut you off. I just thought of what my, my oh, last piece of advice was. Um, please don't say mead with natural flavors uh, on your label. They will tell you you have to say that. I know it's kind of random advice, but it's <laughs> by, I hate seeing it. It's it's awful. It's bad for our industry. And the TTB will say, oh, no, you have to say mead with natural mm, flavors, even if you have like just mead with vanilla. Um but huh. you're not required to say that. So you have to know know that you're not required to say that. You can push back every time and say, no, it's mead with vanilla, and then they have to approve it. Okay. Well, that's good advice because – little, I little rant yeah. there. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see that either. I feel like that's kind of hokey. Anyways. All right. Well, we got one more final part to record. So, Billy, let's, uh, let's talk about that in a second here. But please go check out the links below. Check out the previous episodes also linked below, and we'll see you in part five. Cheers.